I was busy trying to figure out how I was going to compress <laughs> some useful amount of information in a small amount of time. <clears throat> so Ed was telling you about dependency, it looks like. All right, so we'll So what we were doing uh, last time, at the very end, uh, uh, we were looking at the uh, identity type, which never, or identification type, I like to call it, identification type, which never fails to confuse everyone. So uh, I'll explain the introduction rule just to remind you. Uh, it says, if you read it as a expressing equality, it says everything is equal to itself. And the reason why is, well, the reason why is reflectivity. So we can write it like that. And here I'll start using them more often in this lecture, I think, when to use that notation. That's, of course, meant to be synonymous with what I was writing earlier in the day, M and M. The type of identification, well, more generally, between any two elements of A, but in particular for the introductory purposes of reflexivity. <clears throat> and the idea is that every element of the identification type is up to a higher identification. Every element is reflexivity, well, in a sense. Well, well, that you have to be very, very careful when you say that because it depends on what type you're considering it at. So we'll, I'll, I'll be careful. I don't want to overstress that because it can be confusing. But the, <clears throat> the point I wanted to make is that we uh, had different versions of the J rule, so here's one. Uh, it says if you have a family uh, of types indexed by two elements in their identification, you might say morally it's really just indexed by the identification, but the identifications are always between two specific things, so we, it's also indexed by the specific thing, the same question. So see in my conventional reminder that that is a type, and if you wish to read that as a proposition, it's sort of saying there's something that here I'm going to want to prove. Okay, and I'm going to actually have to modify that, but I'm going to want to prove something about, uh, C about something, and the something that I want to prove it about is an identification, which I'll write here, between two points M and N. And so what I'm going to say, I'm going to write it in this form, is going to be something or other uh, that says C holds of alpha, Oh, sorry, I wrote it in the other order. <coughs> uh, M and, and alpha, correct, Y, Z, and C. And, and the sufficient condition, so there's a, uh, a mapping out property, I'm going to turn paths in A, okay, into proofs, if you would like to think of it that way, that C holds of, well, really, of that path, but then it's not going to spread of that path. So you can kind of read it as given alpha and M and N, C holds of alpha, except for technical reasons I also put in the endpoints. 
okay, that are there. So it's just like, it's, it's very similar. It's an induction principle. It's, it would be called, using my terminology, identification induction. And it's very like saying, if you give me a natural number, I want to prove that some C holds of that natural number, and then I give sufficient conditions which are motivated by the introduction rule. That's what we did for NAT. So we're going to do the same here. And the sufficient condition is that there be some proof that C holds for reflexivity, which is always between some two, uh, some, some point in itself. Uh, that will be plugged in for uh, X, Y, and Z in C. Okay? And if that's the case, then the, the, the established notation, which Martin Luff introduced, uh, is X, Y, you parameterize by the motive, the thing you're trying to prove, you give it the information, x dot c, that c is in fact reflexive. Well, I'll, I'll do a version of this in a minute. That, uh, that's x dot c. And you run that on alpha, which is the path we're, we're mapping out of. So it's sort of like saying at the natural number recursor, blah, 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 apply to n. Okay, so this is applied to alpha, applied to that path. It is a proof, well, I left too much room. This, in, this space intentionally left blank. Uh, that, uh, uh, that C holds for M and M. So there are many ways to acquire an intuition about this. And one, that somewhat loose one, as I mentioned last time, because of the Clintonian principle of it all depends on what is, is. Uh, you have to, uh, what you want to say is, well, if I have a proof of something, Ultimately, it must boil down to some reflexivity. It must be reflexivity. This is the B that I slipped in there. That's all depends what is is. Okay. So, so the intuition is, if C is a reflexive relation, and if morally we think of equality as the least reflexive relation, then I should be able to map equality into C, because the only requirement is that it be reflexive in order for that mapping to exist. That's what J is saying. It's just rather subtle, it's not a syntactic condition that every path in the identity must syntactically or must definitionally, calculationally be reflexivity, but it must be reflexivity up to a higher identification of uh, what happened. So that's the rule. And one special case that's kind of useful to isolate it's really just, I mean, it's derivable from that rule, but it's also just a special case of that rule. I can just erase some stuff, but I know that you wouldn't like it if I erased in place, so I'll, I'll, I'll rewrite it. So a special case of it, a weaker form of the same rule, says, well, if I have a family of types indexed by x and y, so now I can think of that purely as a binary relation between elements of x and y. And if that binary relation, that's the way I bring this up, uh, happens to be reflexive, so I, I leave up what I'm doing is leaving out the path part, the identification part, because it's a special case and it's not strong enough to, it only goes in one direction. So this is a special case. Uh, and if I happen to know, and in fact now I do need to name it because of the way the the special case will merge, but if I happen to know that m is equal to n, then equality being the least reflexive relation, it should be the case that something or other inhabits uh, m and n for x and y and z. Because if, if you just read it in your usual mindset, if m is equal to n and c is reflexive, then c must hold of m and n. Right? That's what it's saying modulo the slipperiness of is. Okay? And I could, I, on the spot, call this J prime. I, I, don't, I don't have any reason to think that's conventional. I just, it seemed like a good notation. <coughs> oh yes, and I forgot to mention both J and J prime will satisfy a rule of computation or calculation that says, if I have this and I apply it to reflexivity, or some m, then that will calculate to m for x c, little c. And so if you were to plug in, then it would be m, m, rappel of m, 
which is what we're dealing with here, Russell and M and C. And the exact same thing, where the analogous thing would hold over here, which is that if we just do J prime and we look at X dot C, we apply that to reflexivity of some M, I don't mind what M is, I can calculate that to be an M for X C. So that's a special case that is in some ways easier to get your head around uh, without, uh, uh, by making analogies to your experience with other induction principles that we've discovered, or discussed, I should say, uh, in the course of uh, my lectures this week. <clears throat> and it also uh, uh, makes sense in terms of what equality is. Okay, so you could sort of think of it like that. Certainly in a proof irrelevant context, then there wouldn't be anything to say here. You would just say, M equals N is true. Oh, I forgot to put the alpha there, sorry. Um, if I, it would just say, in some other logic of the kind that, has, that looks more like first order logic or something, let's say, then this would just be a fact that M is equal to N. There's no data associated with that fact, no information associated with that fact. And then if you have a predicate, if you have a binary relation which is reflexive, then of course, if M is equal to N, well, you wouldn't have to worry about all this noise because you wouldn't be talking about proofs. And then you would just say, C must hold with M and M. So you can see that you can get back to safe ground <laughs> where you feel very comfortable, okay, in the case that you suppress the proofs and are back in the, a world where proofs are not relevant. But I mentioned to you on day one that a thing to keep your eye on, the thing that's important to, to keep your eye on is uh, one of the points was uh, this idea of proof relevance. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, that's a special case. All right, so now that's the rule, and I, at this moment, I'm not gonna try to further justify or explain the rule. Um, I don't think I'm gonna have time. There's a, another formulation in terms of the operation of transport, which I'm gonna review with you again. Okay, and it turns out that this elimination rule is, is derivable or interderivable with transport plus another principle. And I probably won't have time to explain the other principle and why you get the interderivability. Or if I do, that will be nice. Okay. So there is available some yet another way to think about this. Um, and I'll just allude to it for the time being. But right now, I, what I need for sure is that J gives me transport. So what we talked about transport before but just I'm reminding you, that says if I have an A index family of types B, <coughs> and I know that M and N, oops, I have an identification alpha between M and N, then, well, just from the point, point of view of logic, the idea should be <coughs> that more, in some appropriate sense, which I'm going to explain, B of M should be somehow equal to the event. So I want to be very careful about that because I haven't yet, there's an issue of pedagogical order. So there's a pedagogical order that's not yet, that's a thing that's not yet available to me to speak it out. So at this stage of development, I will express it in the following way, which is that, uh, which is what I did last time. Uh, and it can be said in, in, in different ways. And one of them is to say, which is what I did last time, that there's an operation called transport, which is parameterized by the family z dot b, that takes the identification alpha of m and n and turns it into uh, a function from m for z b into n for z b. And in a sense that I will make a little more precise but can't go into great detail about a little bit later, this will be an equivalence. Uh, right now, I haven't defined what that is, so again, it's one of these chicken and egg issues. So, I would, uh, but uh, let, let, let's just go with it. This will turn out to be an equivalence, meaning approximately that the fibers are isomorphic. Well, it's isomorphism up to isomorphism. That's a kind of a way of saying it. It's an infinite dimensional isomorphism. And that's what the equivalence really means, but we'll, we'll, we'll not go there right now. Okay, so for now, just to say there's a way of transporting from this fiber to that fiber, and it has the property that if you do 
uh, if you if it if it acts on reflexivity, as I mentioned last time, when acting on reflexivity, it's going to give me the identity. Okay, the identity function on on pet. Oh, excuse me, on M for B. Or another way to write all this is to just put in another argument here and says, well, if I have uh, P, which is in B, uh, B of M, okay, so if I plug in M for B, B, then this P and this P will be equal to P. Okay, I have a computationally equal to P. So I showed you the picture before. So one way to think about uh, families of types, as I mentioned, is we have the indexing type here, and we have elements, so I've, I've called out and distinguished M and N, or particular points in A, that happen to be identified by the identification alpha. All right, and if they are identified, and if we have a family, what it means is that over M, we have a balloon, which is M for ZB, and over N, this family is sending the elements of A to types, right? So the types we tend to draw sort of like that. And it has points. So here's a point, I call one of them T. And the idea is that this alpha induces uh, a mapping from this type to that type that has the property that it sends P over to, well, transport in whatever Z dot B of alpha of P. It sends it from here to here. And as a notational convenience, it's a little ambiguous, but you have to use the context. That can be written alpha lower star of P. It's sort of a push forward sort of thing. That sort of pushes alpha, pushes P in the direct in the direction that alpha is in the identification. Although it's reversible, I'll explain, but it, we think of it a priori as being directed from left to right. It will just so happen that whenever there's one. This way, there's one that way, and I'll get back to that. Okay, so this is the, the, notion of, the notion of transport. So it says I can move things from one fiber to another, and it will eventually emerge that this, that this relationship I mentioned is an equivalence. So if we thought of these as sets, which means they're completely discrete and don't have any identifications, then it would be inducing a bijection that these would go, this, would, this point, this very point would be sent by transport right back to P in that, uh, in the sense of if there were sets, if there were no identifications involved in each bubble, if these were only just self loops, okay, and there was nothing else, such a type was said to be a set, okay, and um, there's a problem with drawing pictures because there are sets that I would depict using having identifications, but they will nevertheless be sets. So you have to be quite careful about some of these things. Uh, the diagrams can be misleading. Diagrams are useful, but they can also be misleading. <coughs> but if these two fibers were discrete, then it would be a bijection. Okay? So you can send them, that, that very map would be a bijection. That is, it would have an inverse, which is the inverse along something in, that I might as well explain right now. OK, so that's uh, the notion of transport. And I'm going to need uh, another, another concept, which is derived from transport, which is uh, it's a sort of a version of equality. It's just a derived notion. So there's a, uh, a derived notion, which is called uh, path over. Or I like to say, I, I personally like, I call it correlation, but that, kind of, that word will have all sorts of connotations that don't, aren't necessarily implied, so your mileage may vary. Okay. So the idea is this, is that it's related to this transport property, that's why I bring it up. Uh, the thing that I, that, I, that I want to say is, if we have a family of types B, uh, we, and we have a path in A, so it's a setup for transport, to have a Path. I, I call identification path. I'm, I'm going to keep tripping over that, so I might as well just say that. So I will use those two words interchangeably. So if I have an identification between M and N or a path between M and N, then uh, I can have a notation which says that 
How many men are morally equal <laughs> or correlated, okay, in the following sense, by the path alpha? So we'll write here z dot b that says we're talking about, so the idea is that this is in m for z b, and this is in n for z b. We'll need this notion, that's why I bring it up, n for z b, okay? And that's, that's what I'm looking at. And so, uh, oh, well, I'm sorry, I, my, I, <laughs> something certainly didn't look right. I was reusing my letters by accident. Okay, so sorry about reusing my letters there. Uh, that's what I meant. Okay, so P is in. <laughs> no, that part was right. Uh, <laughs> that's what got me confused. Okay, P <laughs> is a point in M for CB. Okay. And Q is a point in N for ZB. So they're incomparable. You can't like talk about them being equal. Okay, but they're not even in the same time. Okay. But if we have a way of equating or identifying M and N, these two things are identified. Okay. Then we can say that these elements are that this is expressing the idea that these elements are correlated by that identification. So. This will mean, by definition, that if I transport in z dot b along alpha, which is given here, and I transport m over to the other fiber, then that will be equal to in n for z b n. So in this picture, we're sort of saying, call that guy q, what I'm saying is, P is equal to Q relative to, so this scenario can be described as in the family Z dot B, relative to the identification of M and N, P is morally equal to Q, uh, or yeah, can be identified with Q along alpha. So the point is it's modulo the fact that M and N are equal, or identified by alpha, P is equal to Q modulo that fact. So that, that, that kind of thing comes up a lot. Okay, so we're gonna need those two things, but first uh, let me talk about Should we transport P? Did I goof up? Transport P. Uh, this should have said Q, right? Oh god. Alright, this should have said P. I'm, I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, that should have said P and Q. You transport P along alpha, which goes from here to here. Once you've transported, they become comparable. They're sort of vertical. So if I look in general for, say, here I took Q to be the transport. But if I didn't do that, then what I'm saying is, P can be moved over to here, and then there's a path from it to Q. And that's the, that's the, uh, that's what I'm saying. This expresses an inhabitant of this. If theta were in this time, then beta would be this identification right here. Okay, it says take P over to where it makes sense to compare them, and now P B is the witness to their comparability or to their identification. Okay, so this is sometimes called the vertical morphism. It's, it's taking place vertically above N, and the <coughs> In a certain sense, it could also be called heterogeneous equality, although that phrase has been used for something related, but not the same. <coughs> so you could call it that. So it's a kind of it, it comes up a lot when you're dealing with families of types. Okay, and I'll I'll use that fairly uh, frequently. Okay, so we're okay with that. That's just the definition. I just need a notation. It'll make certain things clearer. Okay. Okay, now let's look at the elementary properties of equality or identification. So I will say, first of all, I will say identification this is a very weak thing to say, but I will say it is an equivalence relation. Okay. Well, one. We already know, I'll start by using a little blackboard shorthand for things. We already know it's reflexive by definition. So 
the question is, is it symmetric and transitive? Well, it's simultaneously uh, obvious and not obvious. <laughs> uh, it's obvious if you think of the identification type as being sort of a least reflexive relation, then uh, it's the diagonal. <laughs> and so it's symmetric uh, and transitive. So you can think of it like that. Okay, if you want to think of a relation as a function order pair, then that's what that is. But here, let's look at how we prove this fact. So the thing that's interesting is, in something like first order logic, you must axiomatize that the thing written equal sign has the properties that it's symmetric, reflexive, symmetric, transitive, and you must axiomatize that uh, everything respects it. Here, it's for free. It's already there. Okay, I don't need to like put in axioms. Okay, governing equality. It's a property of equality when defined in this elegant manner. So what I'm going to claim is, I can write it like a rule, so I can say the rule is, if you have an identification of M and N, I will say that this rule is derivable. Okay. If you give me an identification of M and N, then there's an identification which it begs to be written alpha inverse. We'll get to that. You could write that as sim of alpha or a reversal of alpha or whatever strikes your fancy, okay? Uh, there's some term that has a suggestive name uh, that says that M N equals M. So the, my point here is that uh, equality ought to turn out to be equivalence relation if it's worthy of being called equality. So the question is how do I prove this? Okay, so that's what I want to do, okay? Okay. All right, so the way I'm going to prove this is I'm going to do an identification induction, and I'll do it here. I, I, I only need the uh, I only need the simplified form, okay, the J prime. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I will do an identification induction, and I'll, I'll use the simplified form. I'll do a proof and by identification induction on alpha. It's like sort of magic uh, in a way. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the achievements, uh, well, I'll come back to that later. Okay, so identification induction on alpha. So what does that mean? It means that the proof objects in question, alpha inverse, is going to be defined as, I'll use J prime, okay? And I have to have a motive for the induction. Well, just guess. <laughs> what should the motive be? Okay, well, J prime is the sort of thing that when given information, I have to fill in here, will produce a proof, so alpha is a proof of n equals n. So J prime is going to give me something with n, m and n for x and y in whatever motive I choose, so I have to fill that in here. So if I want it to prove n equals m, what should I choose for my motive? Never mind what happens here, just say the skeleton of the argument is a use of J prime will emit a, a term whose type is M for N, X, Y, and whatever it is you choose, which is the thing we're going to put right here. So regardless of how I achieve that, let's not worry about it. Uh, and why is it M for N? Because it's being applied to alpha, which equates or identifies M and N. So M and N are what go in for X and Y, because that's what J prime says in the upper left. So, what, so based on that alone, what should be the motive? Y equals x. Y equals x. Uh, probably someone said that. Y equals x. Yeah, y equals x, clearly, right? If I, anyway, <coughs> and remember that's a type. Uh, if you wanted to, I know sometimes it can be psychologically like, easier to not be reminded of the connection with equality, just like that. Okay, so that's a type. So if I plug in for x and y in y equals x, then what am I going to get? Well, so that's going to be n equals uh, m. So we're, 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 we're doing well, okay? So the question is, what do we fill in here? Well, the principle of identification induction says it's sufficient to show for any x and a that the motive is inhabited by x and x. That is, you can show me that x is equal to x and x. 
right? Because I want to show that C holds upper left for X and X. Well, what do I put there? Reflexivity, right? Of X. So what goes here is X dot rough away of X. And we'll allow it, we're done. Okay? So that's the proof. So symmetry is already present in the language. Transitivity is a little tricky, trickier, uh, when phrased in this way, I will say, okay. so I want something in M equals A P. So if that's true and that's true, then that's true. But I want to say more than that. I want to actually calculate if you give me evidence for here, for this, and evidence for that, I want to compute evidence for this, which I will write alpha dot beta. You could also write it as transitivity of alpha and beta, if that feels better to you, and any other notation that you might like, okay? But I'll call it alpha dot beta, sort of multiplication of a kind, of a, in a sense. In fact, it's the notation that Ed, Ed uses for, uh, for a composition of maps in a category. And that's quite true because uh, I'll just throw something out there. The identification type is really the HOM object for the type theory, okay? So this is what is going to happen. So we'll, we'll see what happens later. We'll, we'll see about that a little bit later. So it's the notational thing. So that one of our goals this week, which I feel very happy that I think we've largely achieved is to cross-reference each other and reinforce one another from different points of view. So I'm kind of trying to draw those out. That was like a specific objective of mine this week. Okay, so we want to say that this, is, this rule is derivable. And this, this example is going to allow me to, uh, to illustrate something that is, um, well, you can have your opinion about it. <clears throat> it's, the downside of proof relevance is that the proofs are relevant. <laughs> okay, that's basically what I want to say. Okay, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Okay? So, how are we going to do this? Well, what we want to do is I want to define alpha dot beta, okay, to be an element of that type, and it's got alpha and beta to work with, okay? That's what it wants to do. So the way I'm going to do it is one, one way I can, I can do this okay, is uh, to do, I think I can do it by a, I think I can do it by uh, uh, an identification induction on alpha, so we'll try that. So we're going to do J with some motive, which I haven't really written here yet. Okay, let, let me think about this for a moment, because I, I know that I'm going to get into trouble here, so let me remind myself what I did. I have to strengthen the induction myself. I can do this in a different way. It'll 
may not be necessary in the end, but let me follow what I did in my notes. I'll try it like this. There's the whole thing. Let's generalize it completely and just say we have x, y, z, and I. P is in it a x, y. There's a reason for this, but uh, you'll see what that means in that. So now it's in its fully general form. And then I can just plug in M and T on alpha and beta and all the dump. Okay, so what I want is something which could be called P dot Q, and it will be a J day of X. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. So that's that's what I need to what I need to do. Because I can plug in M and P, plug in alpha beta, and then I will get the composition that I want. Okay, so that's good. So it turns out the way to do it, I could do it's sort of fun, but I don't have time to go through all the ways. It's very easy to get stuck trying to prove it. So what I can do is I can say I will I will do it like this. Whoops, I'll get rid of that. Get rid of that. Okay. So I'll have x, y, and a, and uh, p and it a x, y. And then I will have a strengthened induction hypothesis. And I will prove, I'll just refactor it. For Z and A, every if Y is equal to Z, then X is equal to Z. So I should be able to get from here to here, right? Because if I if I manage to prove this, okay, then I'll take Z to be that Z, and I will take the apply that to Q, and then I will get something whose type is hit I X. Okay, so I'm, I'm good. This is, in fact, sufficient. That suffice to show that. Okay, and how are we going to do that? Well, I'll just look at it in terms of the proof term. So I, what I mean is there's just something in here. And uh, something I'm going to put in there is lambda Z. That's an element of pi type. Lambda, I don't know, mu, which is, uh, you know, uh, it, it yz or y equals a. Okay, good. And then what I'm going to do is one way to do this is I can do another j prime on this as the motive. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another j prime. Okay, and I'm going to put in something here, and I'm going to do it on P. Okay, and when I do it on P, what I'm going to do is plug in X and Y into the motive. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it be the motive is going to be X, Y, did Y, Z, arrow, did X, Z. And now, if I do this path induction, or identification induction on P, then I will plug in X and Y into the motive, so the type of this will be id YZ arrow id XZ, that's what will go here. So it'll be, this will go in here, and then I land abstract on Z, and so this whole thing will be in the pi. And then as I previously indicated, if I have an element of that pi, then I can get the thing I wanted, and if I can get that, I can show that that's right. So that's how we're doing it. Okay, so now what I need to do is, uh, given uh, u, or I already have u, uh, given v, okay, what does v have to be? v has to be in a, right? So I have a v in a, and then I want to show that the, I want to give a proof here, and it has to be that, it's a proof that it, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, I want to say it D, Z, arrow, it D, Z, yes. Right? That I need something that instantiates the motive with D and V. So it's it D, Z, arrow, it D, Z, which I've written here, which is, of course, can be witnessed by lambda, whatever, whatever, okay? The identity function. And I'm done. Okay, that's the thing that I can do. Yes. You did not write the I know on Q. Do I what? You're getting a function out. 
Oh yeah, I'm getting a function out. Yeah, you're right. So something had bugged me about that. You're right. I, you're right. Exactly. I can just take lambda z. This is my motive, and now uh, yeah, that's somehow probably why I wanted to write it u. Doesn't make any difference, of course, but I'll bet you in my notes it's u. <laughs> okay, and uh, and that's the that's the first. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. It's both good for me to develop it at the board and bad because I get confused easily. It's hard to do stuff when you're standing in front of the class. Okay, so we uh, so that's one proof. So the point is that this is proof number one, and it has the property. Okay, this proof has the property that well, what property should it have? It's a identification induction on P. So if you look at what I get out of J prime written in terms of J prime, the, the limited version, just to make it clearer. Well, the only property I will get now is that if you plug in REFL for P and concatenate that with Q, you will get Q at the appropriate time. That will hold here, and I, I neglected to mention earlier that a consequence of this particular proof is that REFL of M inverse will be computationally the same as REFL of M. And that's a consequence of the fact that J prime, when you plug in uh, REFL, will give me, plug in M, REFL of M, will plug in M for X and you'll get REFL of M back. Okay, so that's what that will do. So this is the computational equation I get for inverse. It's sort of all you could ask for. Okay, but this is not all you could ask for because, and this is why I wanted to make a point about the downside of proof relevance, is you get that, but what you don't get is p dot refl of n, let's call it, okay, you don't get that that's calculationally the same as p. And the reason is that this, this plays the role of q, and q was never touched in this proof, right? I never bothered about I never bothered about Q. I mean, if you look at it, it, en it ends up uh, being the thing that I, I apply this function to Q in order to get back to where P dot Q to get back to here. And Q was never examined. I never looked at the code of Q. And because I never looked at the code of Q, then I will never be able to have this as a calculational fact. You'll be able to prove, in a sense, that I'll expand on shortly, that it, this is identified with that. There exists an identification of the left side and the right side, but they don't compute. And when you start doing mechanizations, particularly if it's your first time, this kind of thing that this holds and that doesn't hold, you remember I gave you an example of this a few days ago about plus of you know m and zero was m, but plus of, computationally, calculationally, but plus of, of zero and m is well, and now we'll be able to say it is only identified with them. It's not it doesn't calculate to them. So in this case, I have a way around that, okay? Because I can write a different proof, and the different proof, which I'm not going to write out in full here, I'll leave it as an exercise, but I'll tell you what it is, is gratuitously examine, okay, this proof U, okay. That, that uh, the proof that you, uh, the proof that, or Z, uh, the proof that is linked to your Z, sorry, in order to do another J prime on Z for not really any good reason. You don't need to, you just do it. And if you do that, then you will discover that both of these equations hold in sense two. Okay, so this will hold in sense two, it will not hold in sense one. So it's the downside of proof relevance, is that the proof is relevant. And the way you wrote the proof, so the same it was true with addition. If I, have, if I had gratuitously, instead of just recurring on the right argument, which is, I could have done it on the left, but I can pick whichever one I want. And then in the zero case, I just return the first argument. I could gratuitously analyze the first argument and say, I'm trying to find zero plus x. Let's analyze x. If x is zero, the answer is zero. If x is successor. Et cetera, okay? And then you would get definitional equations for both sides of the plus. Well, the same argument is sort of here. Yes, Adam. There's a, a simpler proof that works in, in Coq, 
I'm not sure if there's something that prevents it from working here also, but basically you use beta to rewrite n in the type of alpha, and then you're done. Does, does, does that not work here? Okay, I mean, that may be true, but uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really teaching about clock, so. But, but it should work here too. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Rewrite oh. uses j. Oh, okay, so the argument in question was what? So, so I, I'm understanding j as a general principle to take something that has one type replace an instance of the left-hand side of some equality with the right-hand side, and then you, now you know you have that type. Is that, is that fair to say? Okay. So, so then you have n equals p in beta, so you can replace n with p in the type of alpha, and then you have exactly the type oh, you're looking for. Okay. Well, my, it only amplifies my point, which is there are many proofs, and which one you choose influences how you use it later on. So if I did proof number one, which is in some sense the cheapest argument I could think of, it might bite me later and force me to have to do some equational deductions that I don't really have to do. It's the nature of the beast, you see, because as soon as you, you know, have this idea of proof relevance, which is what makes everything, you know, connect up between logic and programming and so on, um, well, then you're you're, you're, you're in bed with the devil in some way, and so a little bit. And so, so that's uh, that's the way that goes. Okay. So this completes the proof that identification is as the minimum requirement that you could expect of being a notion of equality. So I'm going to say two other requirements that one would expect of equality that are also in choice, and I'm not going to go through the proof because uh, you can do them now, I hope. Okay, in any way, I don't have the time. So I can talk about functionality, okay, which will actually turn out to be expandable into, it will turn out to be enrichable into functoriality, and I'll explain that but only a little bit later. So that will come a little bit later. But right now, I'll speak of functionality. And it's the thing I mentioned to you before, and I'll now write it out like this. Well, I'll say there's a term with the following property. If you give me that in A or B, first I'll do the simple case. And you give me, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, I, can, I can trace it uh, lots of ways, but if you give me X uh, and A and Y and A and uh, some identification P, between x and y, then there's a term called app. It's often written app sub f of p in this case, will be an identification of fx with fy. Now you've seen this before when we were talking about setoids and I was manually defining my own notion of equality. Uh, I define equality of simple types to be, simple function types to be essentially this, but I uh, didn't examine. Now I'm in the context, and I, and I just said that would be your definition, and you can work, uh, you'll have to work with that. Here I'm saying, if I have equality defined in this manner, and with that derived rule, then the functionality property, that is functions respect equality of their arguments, is definable, I mean, it's a derivable notion. I'll be able to define that guy. Okay, so that's what I'm what I'm going to do, and we can. I'll do this one. That's not uh, too hard. So f of t. Okay, I'm going to define this one. And it, what does it want to be? It wants to have that type. That f of x is equal in d to f of y. Okay. So the way I'm going to do it is the thing I have to work with is p. Sort of obvious, so I'm going to do again. I can get away with the J prime, so I'll do that. I have to find some motive, I have to prove the reflexive instance of the motive, and I run it on P, and that will be a proof that f of x is equal to f of y, or it will be an identification of f of x with f of y and f of p. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the thing we're, we're setting up for here. So what should 
this guy, what should the motive be in order to get that as our result? How about if I use different letters? Let's write U, V. What should the motive be if I want J prime to give me this result? One. Well, I claim it should be F of U is identified with F of V. Because the J prime on P, which is an identification of X and Y, will plug in X, of y, X for U and Y for V, and you'll get what you want. So that's a good motive. And now, how do I prove the reflexive case of that motive? Well, I want U something, and what is the type of the something? It has to be F of U equals V, F of U. So, lo and behold, it should be reflexivity of F of U in V. And then we're done. And then we can check that it has the following behavior, that if you're running on reflexivity uh, at x, let's call it, or reflexivity in A at x, that will be calculate to reflexivity in B of f. This fact follows from the property of J prime that I mentioned before. Now, let's look at the more general case, which I, in an offhand remark, screwed up yesterday, and I explained in my email, is what should the statement be if f is in uh, pi x in AB, the uh, product of uh, uh, the, the product part, and I have x and y in A, for which I have an identification P of x and y. Well, there's going to be a term, but let's, uh, before we say what the term is, what should the type be? So, some of you came up to me and reminded me what the type should be, okay? And the term is going to be called at D, because it's a dependent version of f to p. So that's the thing we're going we're to define. But the interesting thing here is what's the slick way to say what the type is? Well, you sort of feel like f should f of x should be equal to f of y. But that doesn't make any sense because f of x is of type b of x and f of y is of type b of y. So they're not even of the same type. But x and y are correlated or identified by p. So what I can say is f of x is equal to f of y over the fact that alpha correlates f and y with respect to the type family x dot b. So that's the path over. Okay. Did I mess it up? P. Uh, not alpha, but p, yeah. Thanks. P. Write it like that. So it says these are morally equal, so to speak. They're in different fibers of B, but the fibers are indexed by X and Y by a, uh, an identification of X and Y. So I can just move F, F of X over and have a vertical morphism, a vertical identification between L, P lower star of F of X. So what I'm saying is P lower star of F of X is identified with uh, in, in, in the, you don't mind me writing it, it would be in y for x, d. It's identified with that, that's what the, that notation means. Okay, so you can, you can do this for an exercise. Okay, write out what that should be. Okay? So that's where the notion of path over is, and then that's my mea culpa, so I had forgotten yesterday when I made an offhand remark. I should know better than to make off any remarks. Uh, that, oh, you could extend this to sigma and pi. That was not really right. You need some other notion to the transport. So the identity type is giving us transport, amongst other things. The transport was a consequence of the identity type. OK, so that's, that. here I'll, here I'll, I'll say, now I, I, now I claim I have a good notion of equality because it certainly satisfies the baseline expectations of the notion of equality. It's an equivalence relation and I can replace equal by equal as a congruence. Okay? 
So I'm good, all right? So that's a good thing. Okay, so that's the, that's the, this is the easy part. Okay, now I'm going to amp it up a little more. Because there's more that you could ask, okay? And I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here as well, I think, I'm gonna compress the board a little bit. I'm gonna erase that proof. And I'm gonna put over here, the reminder that we have transitivity that says, if I have an identification of M and N, and if I have an identification of N, that should say, M and P, then by the argument that I'm about to erase, I have an identification called alpha dot theta, which identifies M and P. So let's well, remind ourselves of that, so that's also derivable. And according to our preference, let me be generous with myself, and I will say, alpha dot ruffle of m is alpha and ruffle. I have part of that n before, so I'll try to be consistent. Alpha and uh, alpha is equal to alpha. Let's just say we, I did it as if we were by proof two. And um, I don't know whether I'm going to need that back, but I'll just, uh, it won't hurt to have it around, so I'll just throw it in there. Okay. So now comes the more fun part. It should be an identification over A. Right. Uh, okay, did I make a mistake somewhere? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you, inevitably. Okay, I'll, I'll try to work over here. Okay, so now the thing that, once you start thinking in terms of proof relevance, the following consideration will come up. Identification is not only an equivalence relation, but it is what is called a, an affinity group one. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, the notion of infinity group void is the proof relevant generalization, the, the most general generalization that I know about, of what it means to be an equivalence relation. Because when I usually speak of an equivalence relation, I don't worry about the reasons why. I just say m equals m. If m is equal to n, then m is equal to m. And if m is equal to m, and m is equal to p, then m is equal to p. In a proof relevant situation, that's all the irrelevant situation, that's all there is to say. But once I broach the subject that the proof matters, and in fact, by Adam's remarks to mine, it really matters, like it has material consequences, <laughs> and I'll show more material consequences. <coughs> the proof does matter, okay? So as soon as you start thinking about the proof mattering, you start thinking about what did I tell you on day one? to keep an eye out for. I gave you four, I think, major points to keep an eye on. When you have proof relevance, I gave you a slogan. Right? No entity without identity. So when are proofs equal to each other? Okay? So I'm going to have proof relevance. Then I want to talk about their equality so that I can say when two of them are equal. Otherwise I don't you could say that you don't really know what they are unless you say what it means to be, what it means for two of them to be equal. So the natural questions to ask, I don't know how to justify that statement. I don't want to sound like I'm just being intimidating by saying things like that, but maybe I'm hoping to convey to you that, that there's something to it, that there's something that should occur to you or could occur to you. As I have the structure of Reflexivity, inverse, and multiplication. That sounds a little familiar. I've seen such a thing before, which is the notion of a group. Okay? Which is it's an algebraic structure. Usually it's defined where you have a set, and you have an element of that set, the unit element, and you have uh, a multiplication, and multiplication has the property that everything has an inverse, and all of that is spelled out by some laws. So I need what are called the groupoid laws. Okay, that I want, these are all going to be theorems, they're not like assumptions, they're things I can prove, but I won't prove every one of them for to you, but you can prove them yourself, they're not hard, um, and uh, you can look them up, so it's the law. So what are the relevant laws? Well, the only difference between 
a group and a groupoid in a sense is simply that I don't have just one set. I have a whole collection of sets and the multiplication is typed. So what I'm saying is uh, if I have alpha which connects m to n and beta which connects n to p, then I'm allowed to multiply. Okay? And so one can sometimes say a group is a groupoid with only one object, with only one. Everything is unitized. So any two things are multipliable. Okay, and everything has an inverse, which is another one of those things. So here I keep track of the type. So here's one of those things, and then its inverse is in the other way. Okay. So it's sort of like thinking of a, a group by its representation as a group of symmetries. It's just that it's not a symmetry on one set, let's say. It's uh, it has this typed character to it. Okay. So that's a way of thinking about it. So the laws, though, are look like the group laws. So they're going to say, if I take raffle of m, and I concatenate that with any alpha, that should be alpha. Well, oh, sorry. That should be, pardon me, some of these will hold to be a definitional equation. But the requirement is the following, and then the reasons why we'll mention. I'll leave some space. I want that to be alpha. So what I mean is, I want there to be, in fact, let me make room for myself. I want there to be a proof of the following fact. I'll call it, uh, I'll call it unit left, okay? And I want it to be a proof, there needs to be a proof, that REFL on the left, for appropriately typed things, I'm not going to write that all down, should be equal to alpha, the unit element times anything it should be anything. But the question is, where is this happening? It's over the fact that M is equal to in A, M. It's in that type. So this is an example of an iterated identity type. And so if you want to use the other notation, it's the identity in which the type I'm talking about the identification is the identification type. And it's an identification between two things which I can't squeeze in them. But this notation is that. So it's an identification of identifications. And similarly, I will have unit right, which will be the other way around. And it will be in uh, n equals a m, or no, it will be, uh, no, be the same. It's just uh, m equals a n with uh, alpha dot ruffle of n, if I'm not mistaken. I want there to be an element there. So in terms of pictures, right, in terms of the pictures, what I'm saying is let me, normally I draw a ruffle as a loop, but let me stretch ruffle out. So we have ruffle between m and m here, and then I have alpha, which goes to n, and then I have alpha, which goes to n, from m to n. If we want to direct them, we can put it like that. And what I'm saying is, this cell exists. That's the unit left. Okay? And the second one says, if alpha takes me, identifies m with n, and then I trivially identify n with itself, well, alpha takes me from m to n, and this cell exists, called the unit right. Okay, so I can draw it as a cell like that, or I can draw it as a line between lines. Okay, it's, uh, then it just becomes some notational convention okay, of how you do it. Okay, then there should also be an inverse left law that says if I do alpha inverse followed by alpha, that's going to be the identity. So if alpha goes from m to n, so this goes from n to m uh, to m to n, <laughs> so to n to n. I hope I'm right. That's that. So that says the picture is I have alpha uh, inverse. I'm starting with alpha inverse, assuming the type the type of draw I used before, uh, and I go back to n. Uh, there's another map that goes here, which is the identity, or reflexivity. Okay. I, I, I often go, um, I often confuse those two.
to it, so excuse me. So it's reflexivity. Okay, uh, of n. And that cell should exist. That's called <coughs> invalid. And there should be n bar, which says alpha alpha inverse equal to n equal to a um, reflexivity as well of m. Well, it has a similar picture I want to draw. So it's an inverse clause. And I need an associator. I need the associate associativity law, which says that if I do alpha followed by beta followed by gamma, that should be in a p with alpha, beta, gamma, which says this thing. But if I have alpha, mn, beta, p, I compose them and make alpha dot beta and then go with gamma, uh, PQR, I guess, PQ, and I need here, so I have, uh, well, I, well that's, I'm drawing the right hand side, alpha, beta, composed, followed by gamma. But I want this line to be the same as this line. So we have uh, uh, alpha again, we have then beta, and we have gamma. Okay, and now I want to say I associate it the other way. So that's beta dot gamma. And then I take alpha beta dot gamma. Now what I want to say is, well, this point and that point are the same, so let me draw that there, okay? And this point and that point are the same, so uh, let me bend this one down here. But they're all two, okay? And now what I'm saying is, this line should be identified with this line that should be a solitary. And that's the associator. So it's sort of saying this thing can be deformed into that thing. That's the way you're supposed to think about it. Okay? And I'll leave these all for homework. You can prove these all. They're all by path induction. In fact, you all by you only need J prime for this. I am reasonably sure. Hmm. No, that may not be true. Let me not say that because I could be wrong. I, I know you can do it by path by identification. Okay, so let's just say we're all by identification. Should never wing it. The thing that looks plausible when I'm standing here <laughs> turns around not being plausible after I get back to my room. So, okay, so that is the definition of a group one. So the point is then that this is the proof relevant exposition of what it means to be an equivalence relation. Oh, and why is it called an infinity group one? Well, the reason is that these are sort of, if this is at you know, dimension one, this is a, a type of identifications of points in N, then this is the type of identification of lines in N. That's what I was showing you. This line, that composite, is equal to that line. That is, there's a, there's a cell that witnesses their deformability or their identification with each other. So I'm now at dimension two when I'm doing this. These are all at dimension two, okay? But now I can you know, start speaking about taking things like uh, composing these, these terms, unit in, in associates and so on, because I can talk about concatenating them because after all, if you just in your mind suppress the subscripts, I have an identification from here to here. If I had another identification from here to elsewhere, then of course I can compose a source with that other identification. And that composition must itself satisfy associativity law, for example, or inverse law, unit law, and so on. And then it becomes difficult to draw, okay? Because then there has to be, as I mentioned, if I think of this as a disk, because I can just reshape it. So this is a disk, okay, that I have got here. And you can see it's having two endpoints. If I go this way and if I go this way, then this is filled in. That's what this sort of picture looks like. That's a disk. Okay? These are all that's a disk. Okay. It was convenient to distort it, but it's a disk. Okay. And then I can talk about taking two disks, maybe. 
and saying that they should be identified, provided their boundaries are equal. See, these two lines are allowed because to be identified because they have the same boundary. So if these two disks have the same boundary, if these lines are the same, then you can think of puffing it out and taking the one disk, which is my left hand, and the other disk, which is my right hand, with the agreement that my fingertips and the heel of my palm are identical, then I can speak of the interior of that sphere. And that interior of that sphere is identifying these two hemispheres, hollow hemispheres. It's just two disks that I warp around like that so that you can see that there's an interior which would be, in principle, can be thought of as nicely spherical. And the interior represents the identification of those things. So there I can kind of show you a picture. At the next dimension, forget about it, OK? Uh, at least, uh, you know. So it's sort of like, you know, lots of things. You know, geometry works well in low dimensions, and then algebra takes over, OK? So this is sort of what happens, because nobody can think about a 20-dimensional 20, 20 sphere in any meaningful way, I don't think. But you're going to handle them algebraically, OK? So uh, this is kind of what we're what I'm suggesting we do here. Okay, so in that respect, what I have is the thing that I mentioned to you last time. At dimension zero, I have points. So at dimension zero, Dimension one, I have lines. At dimension two, I have disks. At dimension three, I uh, have spheres, meaning solid spheres. Okay, and it goes up from there. So this is uh, this is uh, the the picture, and when, and when I yes, uh, so that's the idea. And these are disks because I can only identify lines with the same boundary, two lines with the same boundary, the same endpoints. Those I can speak of identifying, so I get a disk. So this is the sort of globular groupoid, infinity groupoid structure. And one can do this in other ways as well, which are not, it's not appropriate for the syntax of types that I've given you. But there are other ways of doing it where you do points, lines, and then you go up in a different sense. I allow, I consider squares. Where the idea is that if I want to talk about a line between two lines, then a line between two lines is going to consist of a line connecting their two endpoints, and then the, the, the interior constitutes the simultaneous identification of these two guys modulo those guys. So if I think of these guys as pinching together the endpoints, then these two lines are being equated, and I have a disk. Or the other way around, simultaneously, I can think of it as identifying these two lines modulo the identification on these two lines. And the square represents that information simultaneously. Okay, so that's what happens. And then you get cubes, and it goes up from there. So that's a sort of cubicle set idea. So things go up in here. You can draw cubes. Right? Um, these will represent Simultaneous identifications of all of the fa of pairs of faces modulo the other faces. Okay. So that's the idea. And so you can get that kind of a structure. And then there's another version of it called the simplicial set, which uses triangles. I don't have room for drawing it, but you can have triangular shapes and then tetrahedron. Okay. Or you draw those damn things. Okay. okay. Uh, and so on. There's similar similar ways of uh, of doing that. Okay. So, but this is the natural structure from the type theory I've given you. There are other higher dimensional type theories in play, and I haven't talked about those at all. So, the reason for the higher dimensions is because of the higher identifications, and these equations are true. You see, this equation is true in the sense that there's a higher identification of the two endpoints. And those things themselves are identifications that can participate in similar equations whose truth, so to speak, is given by a yet higher identification okay, of, uh, uh, of the, those endpoints and so on. So you 
get this infinite hierarchy of dimensions that are going on. And the, the, the objects that we manipulate here are kind of usefully described as uh, geometric objects of these kinds, lines and discs and spheres, or lines and squares and cubes, and so on. So you can do that. So that's a kind of a nice way to think about it. So the point is, is that proof relevance Innocent enough idea at the outset uh, quickly gets you into some really fascinating questions and uh, topics, and it turns out that this uh, terminology I've been using is inspired by connections with algebraic topology that I'm not going to go into at all. Okay, but I want to explain it just purely from a type theoretic point of view. So, at this point, we say we have uh, what is called what I call a higher type theory. Okay, so we have a higher type theory in the sense that, starting from the innocent-looking J, I was able to induce for you there are symmetry, transitivity that is inverse, and composition laws for identifications, and those inverse and composition operations satisfy laws up to yet higher identifications and so on. And this is what I said to you last time, that in order to be an infinity group void, these uh, identifications have to exist. And you can write these all down. The type theory guarantees that they exist. In the more mathematical framework where similar ideas have been discussed, there is a very different way from what we've been doing here to force the existence of such higher selves and it's called the can condition. And so the idea is that the identification type has, carries with it the full force of a completely, seemingly, a priori other thing called uh, can, uh, the can condition on a, let's say, a globular set or a cubical set or a simplicial set, something with all of its higher dimensions. The can condition is the way of saying that there are enough cells higher up Whereas with just writing the one rule down, J, got all. So this is very remarkable. Okay? And, um, it's, uh, and so people have found that exciting because the connection there is, is uh, remarkable. And A, and B, it seems it's much easier to handle the type theory than it is to handle these infinite, direct, infinite dimensional structures so to speak directly, for lack of a better word, I don't know what to say here, okay? Uh, and, and, and people have found that to be useful. So there are people who are crossing over from one, uh, one side of the fence to the other. Uh, okay, so now I want to say something about the structure of the identification type. I'm already out of time. Oh my god. Okay, I will say... Uh, made an outline for myself, so that I definitely want to do that. Okay, um, okay I'm, I'm actually not too bad. Is it, can I have a little bit more time? Okay, thank you. Um, so here's what I want to say. First, I just, here I can only make a few remarks because uh, I don't have time to say very much more. Okay, first thing is I want to say something about the structure of the identification So if you remember, I, I motivated all of this. Uh, my hope is the things I'm about to say will feel very natural because I've already put you through a bunch of suffering, okay, in order to make this part be very natural. Okay. So I started you out with this notion of let's define our own equality. And we define EQ nat, as I felt like a nice place to start. And we that immediately led us into issues of of uh, what would EQ would nat cross nat be, or any A cross B be, and A plus B, and ARB in particular, pi and sigma, okay? Well, these questions can now be re-asked. So what I said is, okay, let's hold, let's put aside that whole strategy that we were talking about there, rolling our own, and let's, in the erased board, build in a notion of equality, of identification, of proof-relevant equality, so identification, with the property that, according to the J rule, everything in sight respects that guy. 
So that's what makes it be identification. And I just gave you a notion of equality and it gave you arguments that it, it is behaving the way you would expect. So the natural thing to ask then is what does the identification type that let us say A cross B look like? And now we're going to see an echo of what we uh, what I have told you before. So for reasons of time, there's something I'm not going to be able to explain in any detail, which is the notion of equivalence between types. And as I said, for the time being, think of it as isomorphism, but it's isomorphism up to higher identification. So it's sort of isomorphism up to isomorphism. What do I mean is just imagine, essentially an isomorphism between uh, two types would be mappings back and forth for which there should be evidence that their compositions in the appropriate sense are the identity. That's almost true. There's a little, uh, some difficulties that I absolutely don't have time to go into, but that's morally what it is. But what does it mean for their compositions to be identities? Well, it's Bill Clinton again. Well, it all depends on what it is. It is. Okay. So, well, in the most general sense, it means there's an identification of F composed with G with the identity. Not that it literally is, in some direct sense, the identity in some absolute way. It is identified with. And the thing that, and what is an identification? An identification is a thing called a homotopy, which I'll explain. It's a sort of deformation from one function to another. Okay? So that's what's, uh, okay. So that's, in a nutshell, what equivalence is all about. And I'm sorry that I can't explain. I have to wave my hands vigorously. Okay? So, I hope it will be informally meaningful. It will be a theorem you can prove that this type and this type are equivalent. Uh, this you can do as an exercise. Not difficult. Guess what you need to use? Identification induction. Okay. And the right direct the right to left direction is interesting. You you have to think of something. It's a little it's a very little thing, but you have to think of this little thing to make it work. Okay, so you should do that. One of the things I was doing over lunch was writing up the proofs so that's on my mind. We can give other characterizations of other types, but I want to jump on a cut to the chase here. So, the question is, what can I say about the identification type in identifications in the function type? I'll have to call them M and M, but let's call them F and G because that will look more suggestive. Okay. So, what can I say, I'll put a big question mark, about this between them? Well, here's one thing I can say. There's a map here called H apply which says, if it happens to be that F and G are identified by some identification, then for every X in A, there will be an identification of F of X with G of uh, X. That's called H plug. And by the way, you can convince yourself that this should be equivalent. I realize it involves a little hand waving, but you should at least be able to see maps back and forth, and then if you study further, you'll be able to see the equivalence between pi x and y a, if I have an identification of x and y, then I have, uh, uh, I'll, I need a name for that guy. Then f of x, is identified with f of y modulo or over the fact that x is equal to y in what type did I use to be? Uh, be? Oh, in fact, here I don't even need it. If it's a simple type A or B, I don't need it. If I had pi types, that's what I would write. So uh, that was, B is fixed, so I don't have to worry about that aspect. So I could have just said uh, x, x equals y error. They do it with pies, you have to do what I said earlier. You can check that those should be the same, because if I have this, I can take x and y to be the same thing, and 
plug-in reflexivity. And if I have this, I can do a, a path induction on that guy to obtain this from that. Okay? So it, it's not, not difficult. Okay? So these things are the same thing. But there's a map here, and this is definable. So this is an exercise, and this is an exercise. And what you would hope for is an equivalence between these two. Okay? Well, why is that? It's well and good that if I happen to know F and G are identified, then every result is identified. You know, for every argument, the results are identified. Well, that's fine. But I want the converse, and in fact, I want something even stronger. I want to know that the space of proofs of this fact is equivalent to the space of proofs of that fact. That's the stronger thing. But it, it certainly implies this is the right thing, but certainly I should have maps back and forth. Um, they should be in an appropriate sense mutually inverse and there's some technicalities there, but okay, they should be equivalent. But at least they're mapped back and forth. Well, the map back and forth, if you want to have the map this way, is called fun X. It's function extensionality because it's easiest to see by the equivalence I just called out. Okay. It should be that if f whenever x is if y, f of x is equal to f of y, I should have that f and g are equal, or in particular, f is equal to itself when equal arguments give me, oh, that shows that g. Okay, uh, equal arguments, uh, yeah. And if I put an f in both positions, then it would say f of x is equal to f of y. That would be one consequence. So you expect that. This is what you expect. So the idea is that, if you, uh, yeah. so the idea is that, for every argument x, I want to be able to give me an identification okay, between their endpoints. So that's called function extensionality. And this does not exist in what I've been calling DTT, with including, I'll just put it in here, with the identity identification type as I've defined it so far. So we've discussed this before. The, that's why I did that work to make this passage in my lecture go smoothly. We've already thought about this issue, so you know what I'm getting at. So it's not the case that if f, let's say, put f in for both of them, satisfies this property, that it's identified with itself. It simply isn't true. Okay? And in that respect, you could say, perhaps, uh, the way of saying it, that then we're not really doing math, are we? These things called functions are not behaving like what you would have as a minimum expectation of a function. And uh, it's something else, okay? And so that's true. So the question is what to do about it. The way I'm going to finish is I'm going to talk about higher inductive types, a particular higher inductive type, and show you that in the presence of this so-called higher inductive type, I will have function fun x will exist. But fun x creates some problems. So, and that will be bring us right to the cutting edge of research, and that will be a good place to stop. Before I do that, <laughs> let, me, let me mention something. I'll just call it out. I'll just mention it, which is univalence axiom. To say what it is. So this panel was all about, I mean, I, there's lots more to say, but this panel was all about, let's characterize what are the, the space of identifications of various types. So what should be the space of identification of the universe? What should that be? I want to have some sort of equivalence that says the space of identification is equivalent to something. Well, Without further arrangement, it's a very similar scenario. Every such, if it happens that A and B are identified, that is, there's an identification between them, then that will induce an equivalence. That says A is equivalent to B in, in this uh, moderately hand wavy sense that I'm forced to use. Okay? So, Everything in here, a, a path, an identification here, induces an equivalence. So that's something you can prove. 
So what the univalence axiom is just like extensionality in a sense. It says, the axiom says, I want there to be an equivalence between the space of equivalences. Okay? Which says that every identification in here is an equivalence. Every equivalence is an identification. And in fact, those two spaces are themselves equivalent. Okay? So this thing is defined as there exists a function from A to B which has the property that it is an equivalence. And that's where all of the complication that I've been eliding over is of the exact definition of its equivalence. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to explain what, what that, what's going on there. But trust me, this is a meaningful notion, and it's a little delicate to decide what exactly that should mean. Why is it a little delicate? Because proofs are relevant. And I need to worry about the structure of this proof and so, uh, structure of this type. And the idea is I want this type, this type to have at most one element up to higher identification. So in other words, any two paths in here should be identified by higher identification. So the definition here is chosen in such a way to make this fact come true. So A and B being equivalent falls in the category of something for which we can say it's at most true. Because any two proofs of that fact are identified by a higher identification. So up to higher homotopy, there's only one. So then I can just speak of it being the case because there's only one. If there is a proof at all, there's only one but I might not have a proof. So it's at most true. Okay, so we're back to, we're coming full circle here, okay? All right, so let's speak briefly about function extensionality and higher inductive types, because higher inductive types are interesting. So uh, the, the premier example of a higher induction type, higher inductive type is called the interval. So you're supposed to think of the piece of the real line between zero and one, and there's a line that connects them, and that line is going to be called as an identification. And for those of you who are familiar, so that thing is called I. Okay, give that a name, I. And the significance of the interval is that it lets me pick out lines in a space by mapping the interval into it. Okay? So the idea is if I take a mapping from I into A, what I need to do is send zero somewhere, A naught. So I send zero over here. I send one over here, maybe A one. And I send, this is called the segment, seg. And I send seg to an identification between them. So a map from the interval into a space is, a, is picking out a line in that space. Just to check your understanding, what is the map from I cross I into that space? What am I picking out in A? I take an interval, rotate the interval 90 degrees, and I'm taking its product, okay, the product of itself. So I'm specifying a square. Uh, the Cartesian product gives you everything in the middle. So I take this guy and take the product, and you've got that whole square. So I'm identifying, in that case, a square in that space. Somewhere, it doesn't have to look good. There's no notion of angle involved. It's just some blob, okay, for which I can pick out four vertices and fill in. These are the edges. That's the boundary, and I can fill it in. Okay? So that's the important, approximately that's the importance of the intervals. It lets me pick out, well, line squares, cubes. I can do those extremely easily. And I can also do other things. But it lets me pick out geometric figures in a type, in particular a line. Okay. So how is the interval axiomatized? Uh, I closely overuse the symbol 0 and 1. So 0 is an I. That's the end point. 1 is in I, that's the end point. 
And now here's the interesting thing. The segment is an identification of zero with one. Those are the introduction rules. Oh, yeah. What I said here, we've got a left endpoint, a right endpoint, and an identification of those two endpoints, which is called the segment. Okay, that's the, that's the definition. Okay, and now, uh, what is the eliminator? Okay. So, what I want to do is, I want to say, uh, let me see if I wrote it down to be consistent with uh, So, this is an example of a, what's called a higher inductive definition. And what makes it a higher inductive definition? Well, quickly while I find my thing here. I did it like that, okay. What is a higher inductive definition? Well, why is it called higher? Because these are points, those are zero cells, and this is a line between two points. So I've got here two points, and I've got a line, a single line. And I'm supposed to think of this as the free infinity groupoid, this infinite dimensional structure, on that data. Okay? So I have the point zero, one, I have the segment, and then everything else through all dimensions is whatever is forced to exist according to the rules of type theory. So I will have to be able to talk about seg followed by seg inverse and so on. Okay? Things like that. That will have to exist. Alright? Uh, don't you need that the two points are different? What's that? Do you need that the two points are different? That doesn't matter. Uh, Actually, no. Well, they're not different, they're equal, the seg is identified. <laughs> okay, so they're identified. Okay, so you can identify them in a particular model in any number of ways. Okay. So, no, that, that's what's funny, is it's almost, a, it's a unit type, it's equivalent to one. Okay, so that's a peculiar thing. So what is the eliminator? So the reason I call it a higher, higher inductive type, it's going to have a, altogether now, a mapping out property. Okay. So, if I have a motive for the induction, which is written like that, then I'm going to be able to, for any element of the interval, I'm going to be able to give an element of C. And it's a recursor, which is the interval induction, and the motive will be Z dot C, and it will take an argument, and then it will act on Z. It will take three arguments. Okay, clearly. Okay? So what you have to do is you have to tell me what is its behavior on zero for Z, C? What is its behavior on one for Z, C? And, so you have to tell me what to do on the points. And you must tell me that you're well defined with respect to the identification. So it means you have to give me S, which uh, is an identification of C0 with C1 over the segment with respect to Z dot C, Z dot C. Remember what that means is seg lower star of C0 has to be equal to C1 in 1 for Z C the push forward, okay? So I needed the path over. I have to say, these are equal modulo the fact that the endpoints are equal. They're of different types, but they're in the same family, so they're related to each other. And they, they're, uh, but they're in different instances of the family. But those, the, the, their, their parents are twins. So uh, by the fact that I relate them here as zero and one, considering twins to be identified, any of your twins are gonna be annoyed. Okay, then, uh, then I will uh, identify C1 and C0 modulo of the fact that their parents are twins. That's the idea. Okay, tongue in cheek. Okay, so that's the requirement. Okay. Now I'll show you a quick observation, which is a fun fact. Because I'm running out of time. I'm well out of time. The fun fact, with, if I take DTT, plus I have the identification type, and I have nothing else but the interval, 
has function extensionality. I'll give you the high level idea and then I can give you the proof, or maybe I'll email you the proof. What's the high level idea? So, first fact, number one. By the fact, by the picture I drew earlier, what can I say about the type I arrow A? I should be able to say something interesting to characterize I arrow A. What did I tell you I arrow A should be thought of as? Well, the mapping out property says I give you a point, I give you another point, and I give you a segment S. I wrote those C0, so let's see what that is. And, I, and this would really represent the push forward, but anyway. So I have these two points. I'm, 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 looking at, I'm looking at A, and I've identified a line in A. What are the lines in A? The lines in A are the identifications between points in A. Right? So this type should be seen to be equivalent to the identification space of A. This is called the free path space. Okay, that's the terminology. Every mapping from IA picks out an A0 and A1 and a line between them. A0, A1, and a line between them. If I have A0 and A1 and a line between them, then A0 and A1 and a line between them can be turned into a mapping from I to A. Done. Okay? So this is uh, uh, the line. That I, I, you might call this the geometric lines in A. This is a way of thinking about it in A. And these could be thought of as the algebraic lines in A or identification. AKA the identification. This is sort of external view. I'm mapping a line into A, so I'm picking out a line in A. And this is the sort of internal algebraic point of view of the space of identification for some and one. And now I'll watch the kind of amazing thing. So if we look at the lines in A arrow B, the lines in A or B are the identifications between functions in A or B. Okay. Should be equivalent to, well, I can uncurry and I can swap the order of the arguments. And some of you might know, recognize this at least from the notation, that this is a notion of homotopy. Okay, so this is the space of homotopies between uh, A and B, uh, between functions in A and B. And then that I can now uncurry and turn that into So what it says is a line in A and B, in A or B, excuse me, between functions, is the same thing as for every X and A, a line in B. So this is related to the idea that I mentioned earlier, which happens to be on the board. Oh man, isn't that great? So if I had picked out by this mapping, if I picked out FG and a line between them, the space of all such things is going to be, which is the free path space of the function type, is going to be turned into this function that says for every A, you get back the free path space and B. Okay, that's what's going on here. And this is expressing function extensionality. Because it's telling us that identifications are homotopic. That's what's going on here. And this becomes an equivalence when you have I. Now, I can give you the exact proof, but I'll, I'll put it in the email. I'll put it on the piazza because okay, I run out of time. But this is the intuition. The intuition is paths between functions are the same as families of paths in their range. And in fact, you can then show that given f in here, if f and g are identified in here, then I can turn it into, I will be able to give fun x, which goes from here, back to here. Okay, and I'll put that in the also so you can look at it off one. Okay, so now I have one last remark to finish it up.
So maybe it'll take a while to absorb what I've said, but uh, if you work through the details, they're not complicated, uh, then you can, you, when you work through those details, you'll be able to see, uh, you know, uh, you'll see what's going on. I'll send, a, I'll send a post by that. So this is an example of what's now called a higher inductive definition. And you can think of it as a, a proof relevant notion of quotient. I could also call it a PRQ, <laughs> a proof relevant notion of quotient. Because if you just read this declaratively, I have a type in which I have a zero and a one, and zero and one are equal. But where the action is, is in the identifications. Okay? That's what's going on. But now I want you to notice something. With the univalence axiom, there's, so UA, it's a map that goes from here to here that turns out to be an equivalent of all the UA. Okay? So the problem that we're going to have is the following. So now here is the problem. <coughs> is there a computational interpretation you know, of higher and high theory in the form that I've explained? Okay? I call higher type theory. And let me just mention what the issue is. So when I told you about J, let's forget the mode of, oh, I'll just put, you know, here's the mode of, here's X dot C. And when it's raffled, I said this is, he calculates to M per X C. If that were the only identification in the world, then you can interpret the calculational equality provided it's defined in a certain way. There's a lot of finicky details. You can interpret it as, uh, a, you can give a kind of normalization strategy which decides these two kinds of things. And you can interpret that as some, something like a notion of running a program. Let's not go into what is a computational interpretation, okay, because uh, my expectations of it are quite strong. I, in particular, I demand it the polynomial relatedness condition with respect to complexity. Okay, I want to have a cost model for it. So I don't really want to hear about non-deterministic blah, blah, blah. Okay, I want a proper notion of computation. But let's set that aside. Uh, if this is all there were, if the only identification in the system were given were reflexivities, I know how to say compute with it, I can simplify this to that, and we're in good shape. The problem comes now, I would have to fill in to make all the types work, but in an appropriate setting, one of the things I can run J on now is sec. And what am I supposed to do with that? Well, somehow I'm supposed to take advantage, oh, I forgot to fill this in. I'm supposed to take advantage of uh, C0, C1, and S to do some work, but it's not so obvious what to do here. Or another example is what to do given all the types being what they want to be. If the identification in question is, U, let's call it just UA of F, by which I mean an instance of the univalence axiom where the equivalence is F. So you're given F plus a bunch of other data that I've suppressed. Okay. So I'll just write UA of F because I suppressed all the other data. But there's a bunch of other data. Okay. And what am I supposed to do with that? And as of today, nobody knows a good answer to that. Okay, that's, uh, in fact, as of three weeks ago, uh, Chalmers people thought they had an answer to that, and we were working on our answer to that, uh, and we discovered that our, what we were doing didn't work, and then when we asked those guys, they said, oops, doesn't work for us either. Okay, so we very recently ruined the best attempt at the moment by all you could do is work and work and work and work and then you finally get to some case and you realize that doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, it's a little bit sad story but that's the way it is. So what I like about it finishing here is not on a sad note because I don't think it's sad. We're backing up. We have other ideas. I don't know. We'll see what happens. 
But what I really want to do is now I brought you right up to the cutting edge of research. So what we've done is starting with lattices and going at a breakneck pace, I helped you invent type theory and helped you to examine some of the central issues in type theory, proof relevance, what do we mean by is, uh, you know, what does equality, what does equality mean, there's different notions of equality, uh, and uh, connections between type theory, category theory, proof theory. So I wanted to bring all those things home to you. So we've developed all of those ideas. I've glossed over a number of things, of course, but I, I tried to step on the right stones as we went along, the most important, most significant stepping stones. And now I've gotten you, by going through that kind of process, I've gotten you now to where, well, I don't know, we don't know the answer to these things. So uh, it seems worth looking into because type theory has always been about computation from its inception. And there's this cool idea about exploring the higher dimensional structure of type theory, which happens to have some amazing connection to algebraic topology. And uh, one must ask, at least if you're a computer scientist, so what happens to the computational meaning of it all uh, under that kind of generalization? So there's lots of uh, effort going on to understand what that would mean. And I've just given you one you know, threat, one line threat. There are other approaches. There are other, there's lots and lots more things to say. But anyway, at least I can get you to the spot where you can see what I'm working on this week and other people around the world working on this week. So, um, well, I think that's a good place for us to have. So I'll be happy to answer questions, and thanks for your attention this week.